Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's, that's fine. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm George Fibby, the president of the Houston Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. It's good to see you all uh, back again after the holidays. I'm glad we could have this uh, event put together. We've been talking with Josh for a long time about coming to talk with us about this issue and, and about his book, and I'm glad we could finally make it work. So thank you all for coming. Um, we're uh, uh, looking forward to a lot of good programs throughout the year. Um, we're the leadership is going to be getting together uh, here today and then in the next few weeks to kind of plan out our year. So if you have any um, good suggestions for topics, please feel free to email them in. But we're, uh, we're hoping to, again, put together a lot of nice programs for you. If you did not, um, one bit of housekeeping, if you did not um, uh, check in at, at the front or you have not paid for your lunch, please see Will Peterson at the far end um, before you leave. So again, thanks for coming. Um, it's going to be a good event. I'm going to have uh, Eddie LaCour introduce our speaker today. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome again to this event of the Houston Lawyers Chapter. Um, for any of our first-time guests, uh, a little bit about the Federal Society. Uh, we are a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. Uh, this society is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. The society seeks both to promote an awareness of these principles and to further the application through its activities, uh, including our talk today. Uh, now it's my honor to introduce a good friend of the Federal Society and of many of us in this room, Professor Josh Blackman. Uh, Josh teaches property and constitutional law at the South Texas College of Law. Uh, he's the founder and president of the Harlan Institute. Uh, he's also the founder of FantasyScotus.net, which is the Internet's premier Supreme Court fantasy league. You should check it out. Uh, and he, in addition, he's a prodigious blogger at JoshBlackman.com. Uh, in addition to his new book, Unprecedented, uh, Josh has written over a dozen articles about constitutional law. Uh, Josh clerked for the Honorable Danny Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and for the Honorable Kim Gibson on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Uh, most recently, Josh was recognized by Forbes on their 30 Under 30 list of bright young lawyers and policymakers to watch. So congratulations on that recent achievement. Uh, and as you've heard, Josh will be discussing his book, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, uh, which the Wall Street Journal praised as excellent and Professor Randy Barnett hailed as the definitive account of the historic constitutional challenge to Obamacare. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Josh Blackman. All right. All right. How's everyone doing today? Good. I thank you. I gave a talk on Monday in Philadelphia where it was about 11 degrees below zero, so this is actually a much easier sell. Uh, thank you to George and Will and Eddie and Marcella and Stephen and everyone else for welcoming me to the Federal Society. Um, I've been in Houston now for about a year and a half, and I've really felt I felt welcome. I have. It's been a very good experience for me, and I'm honored to be here today. Uh, before we start, we have a giveaway. Okay. All right. Marcella graciously donated a copy of the book, which I've autographed. And the book goes to the person who can answer a two-part question. One, explain the Chief Justice's Anti-Injunction Act opinion. And two, is the AIA jurisdictional? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? Explain Chief Justice Roberts' Anti-Injunction Act opinion, not the Commerce Clause, the Anti-Injunction Act. And two, is it jurisdictional? Oh, man. I might ask the question again at the end and see if anyone can answer it. Actually, it's a good challenge. No one? Wow. Okay. What's that? George? The book just stays on hold. We okay. You know what? The book stays here. Eddie Garden. All right. So the topic here is one we are all intimately familiar with. This is Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. And I actually must confess, the book's not complete. Okay. I sent this book to press in the summer of 2013, and I thought, okay, you know, Obamacare's done. The Supreme Court upheld it, whatever. But here we are, almost a year later, and this thing is still going on and on. I'm actually working on a sequel, which we call Unraveled, which tells the next few years of the the, the struggle against Obamacare. But this story was really um, unprecedented. Um, I think it was unprecedented in several respects, and I don't use that term lightly. You had a president who had his landmark piece of legislation 
that would change a huge portion of our economy challenge for the Supreme Court. You had a Congress that was, at the time in 2009, had a supermajority of Democrats. You had 60 votes in the Senate. You had over almost 300 votes in the House. So you could basically pass whatever you want. But ultimately, it will be the Supreme Court that would come down to decide, is this law constitutional? Will this law survive? And at the bottom, it's the Constitution. This document, this grand charter that, that, that girds everything we do, especially the federal society, to make sure that we are a, a government of laws and not of men. So let's talk a little bit about health care. Health care is very expensive. Uh, and there, for many years, there have been a lot of attempts to make it cheaper. Now, I always show this picture at uh, law schools. No one ever knows what the heck this is. So what is this picture? <laughs> uh, Eddie already said my age, so you know how old I was then. But, you know, what, what is the picture of? Hillary Care, of course, Hillary Care. This was this was Senator Hillary, uh, for, sorry, then First Lady Clinton's hmm, effort to try to reform health care. And uh, okay, so who knows what this picture is? This one's tougher. Harriet and Louise. You don't get a free book for that one, though. Okay, <laughs> Harriet and Louise. So, so I actually remember these commercials. Uh, these were run on TV in the early '90s. It was this, you know, average Midwestern mom and pa sitting at the table saying, you know. I don't like this new health care service. If you actually go back and watch the commercials, what was their complaint? Like, I like my doctors. I want to lose them. Like, I don't want to lose my health insurance. I like our health insurance, okay? So put that in the back of your mind, right? <laughs> they learned very well that if you want to sell health care reform, we have to tell people, you can keep your insurance. Don't worry, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> But this was the backdrop. There's actually this great video of Ezra Klein in 2000 saying, listen, we need to tell people they can keep their insurance because that's the only way this is going to work. Anyway, we have this. But Hillary Care went down in flames. The Republicans in part took over the House in 94 because of this. And we didn't have any even uh, noticeable effort to reform health care until 2009 when President Obama was inaugurated. Speaking of inaugurations, uh, this is another question not for a book. Obama holds a record with FDR regarding inaugurations. What is it? Most. What is it, Ted? Most How many? At least three. Four. Four. Ready? Ready? Four. First one, he and the chief flubbed the oath. It was actually partly both their faults, okay? So then they did a do-over uh, the next day in the White House to make sure he was actually president, okay? Fast forward to 2012, okay? So January 7th. I'm getting there, Ted. He was re-elected. Smart ass. He was re-elected. <laughs> He was, Ted and I are good friends. He was reelected. All right, Ted, what day does the Constitution say the, the inauguration takes place in? Oh. Anyone know? It's in the Constitution. January 20th. January 20th. This year, 2013, last year, January 20th fell on a Sunday. And of course you can't have an inauguration on a Sunday because no one will come. So they had the real inauguration in the White House on Sunday and then the fake one on Monday. So he's actually taking the oath of office four times from Chief Justice Roberts. And I think the, the dynamics between these two is just fascinating. I would have loved to hear what Roberts and Obama were saying <laughs> in 2013. Anyway, we'll go on. So we get the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act 2010. The patient protection part has been stripped. We don't even hear about that anymore. Because it, what they wanted to stress was affordable care. We don't actually hear much about that either. But the, the, the gravamen was we have, to, we have to do several things. We have to make health care more available, make it more affordable, and not discriminate against people with health conditions. Okay, These three things are impossible to all achieve. You can't achieve all three. You can't make it more available, cheaper, and not discriminate against people. Okay, Insurance works as an actuarial market. You, just, you, you price based on risk. That's how it works. If you want to not price based on risk, the prices go up. Okay, If you want to make it more available, you can be bringing in more people who are not going to be paying a lot, the prices go up. These are these three elements. And I'm not judging which is the right element, but you can't have all three go up. But this was the promise on which Obamacare was sold. The promise was, if you like your insurance, you can keep it, and it will make your health care more affordable. This was demonstrably false at the time it was proposed, and even more demonstrably false now when we see what's happening in the last few years. But I digress. Because in the first instance, there was no way to stop it politically. Democrats had 60 votes in the Senate, and they had a gobble of votes in the House. This could beat a filibuster. Okay? But what was the objection? Not that this would only destroy health care. It, the objection was the Constitution, or more precisely, the Tea Party. Okay? So we don't often talk about the Tea Party now. This is a group that's kind of fallen into, into destitute. They have rallies, but we don't hear much about them anymore. But back during the summer of 2012, this was huge. This was a very big deal. I'm sorry, summer 2009. This was a very, oh, yeah, summer 2009. It's a very big deal. 
And this group kind of just popped up almost spontaneously. And their, and their focus was really on enforcing a narrow scope of federal power. This is what they were looking at. They wanted to reduce the scope of Washington. And their number one target, their, 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 their bullseye, was right on Obamacare. And what's fascinating is their objection wasn't only that Obamacare is bad policy. Sure, certainly it was. Their objection was that Obamacare violated the Constitution. And if you study the history of constitutional movements, when people ground their objections in our Constitution, they become much more powerful. Okay? Look at the abolitionists, you know, the Civil Rights era. They would always ground their, their beliefs in what the Constitution does and does not allow government. And this makes a much higher transcendent argument. And I actually, I, didn't, I wasn't at the rally, but I was in Washington when the main rally happened. Um, and I remember actually seeing people holding up signs saying, overturn Wickard v. Filburn, right? You're seeing people, they didn't go to law school. You know, they, they didn't study the Constitution, but they have enough gumption to want to study this themselves. Say, okay, what is this Commerce Clause thing? You know, what limits does a place where government can do? If I want to grow my own wheat or weed, can I, right? So you actually have these people who are committed to constitutional governance, which I, which I found remarkable, which is an amazing byproduct of this entire struggle. But anyway, they didn't impact the outcome, right away at least. So in the Senate, this was a, a preview of things to come, Harry Reid wasn't much interested in debate. Um, the actual Affordable Care Act, okay, who knows how many pages the ACA was? This is not a book question. I should get smaller prizes. Who knows how many pages the ACA was? Uh, it depends on the pagination. In this pagination, about 2,700 pages. Okay, 3,000 pages. It was introduced. It was introduced the middle of December 2008. It will be voted on December 24th, 2008. There were roughly two weeks for it to be out. No one read it. No one read it. Maybe as your client, but no one else read it. It would have been impossible to read. There's like three copies of Atlas Shrugged stacked and even more painful to get through, okay? No one could have possibly made the way through this entire behemoth of a law. Famously, Nancy Pelosi said, you have to pass the law to find out what's in it. And she wasn't being entirely sarcastic. Since this law has been passed through rulemaking, there have been a stack about this high of rules. McConnell had this great picture. That eight-foot stack of, eight, uh, of APA rulemakings that have come out of Obamacare since then. This is a leviathan of a law, okay? But no one had time to read it because they had to pass it before Christmas. Why? Well, so they can get home. You know, the, 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 for the recesses. But more importantly, this Christmas Eve vote was a test vote. Can Harry Reid keep his 60 vote caucus in line? And with mechanisms such as Louisiana Purchase and, and, and the corners are kickback, he was able to keep everyone else uh, more or less in line. And Joe Lieberman finally joined on. Okay? So Christmas Eve, first time they voted on Christmas Eve in the century, it passed the Senate 60 to 39. There was one Republican who wasn't there. Okay? Passed the Senate. But then something funny happened. Right? <laughs> Senator Ted Kennedy, who spent much of his life championing health care reform, passed away the previous summer. The governor of Massachusetts had appointed a, a, a successor, a, a Kirkpatrick, I think his name was, right? But then something funnier happened. Scott Brown. Scott Brown. Let me put this in context. Obamacare passed the Senate December 24, 2009. By the first week in January, Scott Brown was elected, okay? He was elected as a Republican in Massachusetts. He was elected as a Republican in Massachusetts to stop Obamacare. His entire platform was, I am the 41st vote. I will stop this law. A Republican was elected into the Senate in Massachusetts to stop Obamacare. A Republican took Ted Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts to stop <laughs> Obamacare. Holy cow. I mean, this is just stunning to put in perspective. This was not a popular law. The president was not acting at the public will. If Massachusetts would elect this guy to stop this law, what does that say about the state of Obamacare in 2009, 2010? What does it say? Okay. What does a fox say? I don't know. I'm teaching Pierce to be posted a few days. <laughs> I got, a, I got my, my, my property thing back on. Anyway, what does it say? This was not popular. So now the Democrats had only uh, 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 59 votes in the Senate. And as we all know, unless Harry Reid abolishes it, that means you have a filibuster, right? Right? We have a filibuster. Did that deter the president? Of course not, right? We all know schoolhouse rocks, right? How a bill becomes a law, passes the Senate, right? Passes the House, and then goes to the White House. And he's, yeah, no, that's not how we do things with, with, in, in Obama's America. We don't do things that way, okay? So how did, we, how did the president go about this? Well, the easiest way would have just been for the House to pass the Senate version of the bill, right? No problem. But the House didn't want to pass the Senate version of the bill. 
Why? Because there are lots of things in there they didn't like. The core equals for kickback, Louisiana Purchase, some stuff on abortion, a lot of stuff they didn't want. Okay? <clears throat> so what did Nancy Pelosi decide to do? Well, they made changes to the Senate bill. Okay? They made changes. So usually when you make changes in one house, the other house has to approve of those changes. Right? That school house rocks, right? No. Because the second the law went back across the hall to Senate, it'd be filibustered and killed. So what Pelosi actually had to do, oh, by the way, this is John Boehner with the entire bill. I love this picture. Anyway, so what Pelosi actually had to do was use something called the budget reconciliation process. Anyone ever heard of this? Okay. So generally, when you're passing a budget, right, something to raise revenue, right, you pass a budget. If there's a difference from one house to another, it can be reconciled without going through the filibuster process. This is usually meant for you know arcane things, small fixes here and there. Okay. Pelosi decided to use a reconciliation process to rewrite a 3,000-page law. This wasn't take out this, take out this. So if you think of like track changes or red lines, she redlined the entire 3,000-page bill and inserted a new 3,000-page bill in its place. Only in Washington does this make sense. It's law passing. Okay. So she effectively rewrote the entire bill, and they did this weird mechanism where they actually voted on a bill that wasn't the actual bill to approve the Senate bill that also wasn't voted on, and then sent to the president, who then sent it back to the Senate, not subject to the filibuster. If that makes no sense. Don't worry about it. It's not supposed to. But they used some very surreal um, uh, mechanisms to pass this law to avoid the filibuster. Okay? This, this, this was chicanery of things to come. Um, the goal was to pass this by hook or crook. It didn't really matter how. It didn't even matter what was in it. And in fact, the bill we're stuck with now was a draft. I can't stress this enough. The Scott Brown election forced us to pass a draft version of the bill. There are a lot of errors and bugs that were in that draft that might have been figured out. For example, Medicaid exchanges. I'm sorry, the Obamacare exchanges. You might have heard about this too. Okay? The, the law that's written says only state-run exchanges can offer these subsidies. Okay? Well, unfortunately, the federal government's running subsidies in 30-something states. They have no textual statutory authority to give out these subsidies. Zero. And Professor John Adler and Michael Cannon and others are actually challenging this. Uh, there are a host of other little bugs and wrinkles. Uh, I can't even go through them all. But we rushed a bill that will dis disrupt one-eighth of the American economy. Okay? We rushed it because they had to get it passed before it got too unpopular. As it was, look at the vote. Okay? 219 yay, Democrats 34 nay. Okay? See that big goose egg right there? Zero. Not a single Republican bought it. Now you might argue that the Republicans are being recalcitrant, that they didn't want it, uh, that they're trying to be obstructionist. Fine, but look at the public opinion polling. Obamacare has never peaked above 50% popularity. Never. Still hasn't. There's still a third of Americans want to repeal the law four <coughs> years later. So in many respects, this was a divisive issue. And if you go back and you look at major landlord legislation, the Social Securities Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, these were all laws passed on a bipartisan basis, all of them. I actually did the math. The Civil Rights Act had more segregationists vote for it than Republicans voted for Obamacare. Okay? L Maybe credit LBJ as being a good arm twister and getting people to persuade. But the president made it clear that he was not interested in having any Republican support. And it's no wonder the law we're stuck with now is such acrimony. Because simply put, it never had the buy-in, right? When you have this many people invest in the law's defeat, how can this possibly ever succeed? It can't. So anyway, despite the fact that the law didn't actually pass both houses, nor did this tax originate in the House, I'll, I'll get back to that later, it goes to the president's desk. And if you see here, he has uh, 23 commemorative pens. What he actually does is signs a different part of a signature with each pen and hands them as souvenirs, kind of like that book which no one might even get. So <laughs> no one gets it, goes back to Marcel, it reverts. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, as the president signed it, he, he said to me like, um, okay, this was March 23rd, 2010. Okay, he signed it. Three months after it passed the Senate, he said something like, the battle over health care reform is over. <laughs> this is March 2010. He said, he said, the fight over health reform is over. This is the law of the land. <laughs> I can't even say without laughing. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I try. I, can't, I never can never make it through. This is the law of the land. It is done. It is settled. This is the law. No. No, 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 no. I got at least two more books out of this. So, <laughs> anyway, this is unprecedented. The sequel will probably be unraveled. And if I'm right, the, the final part of the trilogy will be undone. But I, we'll see. Anyway. Uh, we'll see. 
maybe I'll be undone by that point. So uh, <laughs> what was the problem? The problem was the Constitution. And is Obamacare Constitution? So mini, mini combo lesson, just a mini briefing. Okay, who knows what case this is? Ted, stop. Anyone else besides Ted? Yes, where could be Phil Byrne? Ted knows everything. Okay. Oh, he's sitting front row center, by the way. So, yeah, you're a gunner. I actually gave a talk at your alma mater, Chicago, in the Barack Obama classroom, too. That was kind of fun. <laughs> I don't know, but there's a big picture of Obama outside. Anyway, so yes, Wicker v. Filburn. This was a case, of course, involving the Commerce Clause, right? So you had farmer Roscoe Filburn. He was in Ohio. He grew wheat for himself and his family and his chickens, and he didn't sell any wheat on the market, okay? And this is Secretary of the Agriculture, Claude Wicker. You these ominous graphs in the background, all these projections that were all wrong. Anyway, you have, you have Claude Wicker, right? And Claude Wicker said... You, farmer, you cannot grow this much wheat. We want to limit the amount of wheat you can do to make wheat more affordable in the interstate market. Okay? Filburn goes, no, I'm not selling wheat on the market. This is only for my own consumption. It's not leaving the farm. And what did the Supreme Court hold? His decision not to buy wheat on the interstate market impacts the price. Because had he bought wheat, it might make prices different. His decision to grow wheat only on his own farm is interstate commerce. Okay? This was one of the first New Deal opinions that greatly expanded the scope of how Congress can regulate intrastate activity. Okay? If intrastate activity has some sort of substantial effect on interstate commerce, Congress can regulate it. Okay? Okay, so they have you know the strong commerce called power. All right, Mr. Smarty Pants, what case is this? Oh. He beat you. Right. Rage. This this picture better? Okay, so this is a case of Gonzalez v. Rage. This was a 2003 case involving Angel Rage. Uh, she lived in California. She had a number of inoperable tumors, and the only thing that alleviated her symptoms was medicinal marijuana. Ted, what's this thing? <laughs> Eddie? <laughs> yeah, vape. Yeah. At NYU, the guy was like, vape. Yeah, no, it's a vaporizer. <laughs> this, this is used to imbibe marijuana. I've never used it. I've never seen one in person, but apparently this is a... This is a way that, that you can... That you can ingest marijuana without a, I don't know, rolling stuff, I don't know. Anyway, so she used marijuana that was grown on a farm in California. It never left state lines. It never even left the county. It was The seeds were from California. It was grown in California. Purely a product of California, right? Okay. Feds raided her ranch, okay? She was represented by Randy Barnett, who wrote the forward to my book, and they sued, saying that Congress cannot regulate this. And the argument was, unlike Wickard, there's no market for marijuana. This is not some sort of regulated, you know, commercial market, right? Ted, did she win? No. This is actually the phone call of her learning that she lost the case. She, she was very sad. She's still alive, thank, thankfully. Um, what did the court say? They said a couple things. So the first the case was 6-3, and the court said that, um, you know, her decision to grow this marijuana and use local marijuana impacts the interstate marijuana market. What interstate marijuana market you ask? I don't know, but, but ask Justice Stevens. I'm sure he'll, he'll give a speech on it. Anyway, but the interesting one was Justice Scalia, who concurred on the Necessary and Proper Clause, right? And what does Scalia say? Congress has an interest in, in regulate, regulating the broad drug trade, and this is a necessary and proper incident of that power. In other words, in order for Congress to effectively police the drug trade, it needs to be able to crack down local people growing pot. Okay? All right. This has been abdicated because the federal government only prosecutes marijuana, but we'll, we'll talk about that for another lecture. So what the heck does broccoli have to do with health care? Okay? So the linchpin, the core of Obamacare, how does it work? Okay? As I mentioned before, it tries to make health care more affordable, more available, and it can't discriminate based on price. Okay? So what's to stop me, this young strapping person under 30 apparently, from not buying health care and waiting until I get sick and then buying it on the way to the hospital? Actually, not much. But the way Obamacare works is by imposing something called the individual mandate. Okay? What does the mandate do? It says if you don't have a qualified health care plan, you pay uh, this penalty, and the amount fluctuates based on your income. It's actually not that much. It might go as high as five dollars $600. And for most people, it's actually less than the cost of insurance. Put that aside. But they said if we make people pay this penalty, they're going to choose instead to have insurance. Okay? Well, well, what's actually going on here? Is Congress regulating the insurance market? Or is Congress forcing people to buy a product? I'm not going to persuade you either way on this question, but this is how, how the issue was framed. What Randy Barnett and others did 
was they turned the issue on its head. This is not a regulation of the interstate commerce market. Okay? Instead, this is a regulation on your decision to do nothing. Okay? I'm sitting at home on the couch doing nothing, which probably never really happens. But assuming it actually happened, can Congress tell me that I have to buy a commercial product? Can Congress force me to buy something? Okay? That request was unprecedented. Never before had Congress compelled someone to buy a commercial product. It's never happened before. If Congress can make you buy health insurance to improve our health care industry, can they make you buy broccoli to make you healthier? Can they make you buy a gym membership to make you healthier? Can they make you buy a GM vehicle so Detroit doesn't go bankrupt? Okay? These are not fanciful questions, um, and people often scoff at it, but it was never before even conceived of that the government could make you buy health insurance. So I think there's an important line to be drawn. So we have Stewie, right? We have Simpsons, and we got buying you a Chevy, all right? So here are the key constitutional questions we have. So let's go back. Yeah, the, the battle over health care reform is over. This is the law of the land, March 23rd, 2010. Not so much. So within minutes of the President's ink drying, there was a race to the courthouse. And I mean a race. You had lawsuits that were going to be filed in two main places. The first one was in Florida by the Attorney General of Florida. And the second one was in Virginia by then, I said then, then Virginia uh, 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 Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, an alum of my law school. Uh, Florida got in first. They waited about 11 minutes. And then uh, Virginia had some, had some pacer filing problems. It took another 10 minutes after that. So uh, <laughs> this was the race to the court. As people laugh, laugh at pacer all the time. Uh, by the way, does anyone know that Ken Cuccinelli is representing Rand Paul in a class action suit against the NSA for surveillance? Did, did anyone see that? Yeah, it's on my blog. If you read, you know, I can't make this stuff up. Ken Cuccinelli is representing Rand Paul in a suit against the NSA for wireless surveillance. Why, why not? Anyway, so Cooch decides to go it alone. I talk about this in the book. But Cuccinelli did not want to join the Florida litigation because he wanted to be governor. It didn't, didn't work out. Anyway. Uh, but remarkably, Cuccinelli was actually able to persuade a district judge, Judge Hudson in Virginia, that the Commerce Clause argument worked. He actually, despite standing, I won't talk about that, but he had, he had no standing. But the Commerce Clause argument actually worked. He got a court to buy it. And a district court in Florida was the first to say that Obamacare's mandate is unconstitutional. This is my angry Obama picture. He was not happy. Because up to this point, every law professor, except for like three, and like Richard Epstein, said this was clearly constitutional. This was so constitutional. This is stupid. There's no, there's no dispute here. Okay, well, now you have an Article Three judge who bought it. And that does something significant. That, in the words of Jack Balkan, takes the argument off the wall, puts it on the wall. Now we're actually having legitimacy, okay? And, and throughout this entire time, Obamacare remained unpopular. This was the surge of the Tea Party. They were, you know, they killed in the November primaries in 2010, you might remember. They, they took the House because of this, okay? The main suit that was actually in Virginia with Judge uh, 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 Fred, I always say Roger, Fred Vincent, um, uh, and he, no, Roger Vincent, Roger Vincent. So he actually had the case with, at the time, 26 states in the union. So 26 attorneys general pulled together to challenge this. And he found that Obamacare was unconstitutional in its entirety. Not even just the mandate. He didn't sever. He found the entire thing was unconstitutional. And this was frankly stunning because now we have 26 states have a challenge that won. The president was not, 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 not happy about this one. So off to the courts of appeals we go. Uh, the, the major battles were fought by who else? Uh, uh, Superman, Paul Clement, uh, who has also just filed another lawsuit yesterday on behalf of Senator Ron Johnson challenging the fact that Obama, that, that Capitol Hill employees get uh, subsidies and they shouldn't. It's so much litigation. Okay. And versus Neil Katyal, who was uh, effectively Solicitor General, because then S.G. Lena Kagan decided she didn't want to do this. So uh, we have the, this battle. Okay. So the first uh, uh, main battle was actually in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and what was striking about that one was actually Judge Jeff Sutton, who's a prominent federal study member, ruled in favor of the government. And Judge Sutton had the opinion on standing, which I won't bother going into, but a lot of pundits said, you know what? We have now a, a prominent Republican-appointed judge who upheld this law. We think the Supreme Court will do the same, okay? And the president was thrilled with this one. <laughs> I, I clerk in the Sixth Circuit. But I got there about a month after the decision, so I had no involvement, okay? 
So the 11th Circuit, this was the main event, though. This was actually the appeal from Florida. And at this time, Paul Clement was going to be arguing. And you actually had a panel with Judge uh, Frank Hall, Frank's a female, and Ju uh, Chief Judge Dubino. And they actually issued a joint opinion finding that Obamacare mandate was unconstitutional. They severed it. Okay? Uh, uh, there was a blistering dissent as well. But now we had something significant, right? We now have a circuit split. Okay? At that point, it wasn't even clear if the Supreme Court would ever even take the case. People thought, oh, they'll never take this. Okay? I, th I thought so too at a time. But now you have a circuit split. They got to take the case. There's no way to resolve this. And, and the president, I don't think he was very happy at this point. There was another opinion from the Fourth Circuit, which people kind of forget about. Um, this was the Cuccinelli case. Now, they actually tossed Cuccinelli's suit on standing, but there was another case in Liberty University. And there was actually an interesting issue. I've been talking about the Commerce Clause a lot, but I haven't mentioned the taxing power. Okay? And the law that was passed in 2009 was very clearly a penalty for not having insurance. Okay? The president went on TV many times and said, this is not a tax, this is not a tax, this is not a tax, this is not a tax. Members of Congress said, we are not raising taxes. The statute said, this is a penalty, this is a penalty. Any, any additions that said it was a tax were struck out. Okay? This was not supposed to be a tax. The second they go to court, they say, oh, oh, it's a tax, it's a tax, it's a tax. Why? Because the taxing power is much broader than the commerce power. Go read Helvering v. Davis, the Social Security cases. The taxing power is very broad. Okay? The Fourth Circuit, actually, uh, one of the judges at least, held that it was a constitutional tax. But there's a problem with this, and I'll get to this in a moment. We have a new SG, Don Verrilli, who got a really bum rap, but I think he actually did a decent job for reasons I'll explain. So we had a case in the D.C. Circuit. Okay? D.C. Circuit also upheld it, and also significantly with Judge Brett Kavanaugh, uh, another prominent uh, George B. Bush appointee, who upheld it. But Kavanaugh's opinion was interesting, okay? and i got to give you a little bit of tax law. And I, I, I apologize in advance. If you want to leave the room and go take a nap, you're, you're welcome to. So there's something called the Tax Anti-Injunction Act. Okay? What is a Tax Anti-Injunction Act? I never heard of this before in this case. Okay? If you don't like a tax the IRS assesses to you, what do you do? You have to pay it, and if you don't like it, you can sue on it later and seek a refund. Now, that goes to this Tax Anti-Injunction Act. Could you imagine the havoc that will be re Whenever anyone got a tax bill, they first went to federal court and sued on it for eight years. No one would ever pay their taxes. So this law says any tax that is assessed must be paid, and then you can sue in federal court later to try and get a refund. Okay? All right. So if Obamacare is a tax, right, that won't be collected until now, 2014, there's no standing. You can't sue in court until it's collected. So the government was in this weird position, right? At first, they actually made this argument and said, oh, it's a tax. Come back in 2014, right? Yeah, but Obama dropped that because they need this resolved before Mitt Romney gets elected. Like, they, did not, they did not want this running another three years. It would create such havoc with the law. Can you imagine? So that made even a better book. But here's the problem, though. If you argue that it's a tax, the court can't resolve it now. They can't. They lack the jurisdiction. That was a question I asked before, which I'll get back to. The court would lack jurisdiction to hear it now. Okay. But Judge Kavanaugh, who was a brilliant uh, jurist, had this one sentence. It was actually, it was only one sentence in opinion. And he said something like this. If we read the law a little bit differently, right? I'm paraphrasing. If we change a few words, if we say sh we change shall have insurance to shall pay a tax penalty, just add a couple words here and there, the law becomes really constitutional. Because if this is just a tax that's assessed for not having insurance, you're under Helvin v. Davis. You are now like a Social Security payroll tax. And that will be easy to uphold. So what, what Kavanaugh said was, listen, let's, let's be real here. Like, look, we have a duty to uphold the law's constitutionality. We read the law just a little bit differently. We just tweak it, right? We, we can save it. Okay, that was not lost on the Solicitor General. And almost everyone missed it. Yeah, Kavanaugh had this like 75-page tax opinion, which, God bless him, but it's painful to read. He actually said this is not an easy thing to read. He said something like that. But that one line stuck in the craw of the SG, because to that point, it hadn't been really argued well. The tax argument had been kind of backpedaled, because the, the, the statute said this is a penalty. They went out of the way not to call it a tax. When Congress wants to call something a tax, they know how to do it. They're not, they're not afraid. This was not a tax. Anyway. So President, this is my happy Obama picture. He, he was happy at this point. So now he had three courts of appeals upholding it, you had one court of appeal striking it down. 
off to one first street we go. And here are the justices. Don't they look so happy and smiling? Just said wearing her teeth. She's smiling. You know, every, everyone's just thrilled. Uh, you know, they're all they're all so happy. But um, the court hasn't hasn't always had good relations with this president. So who remembers this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but people don't remember the context, though. So this was January of 2010. Okay, this was about three weeks. No, I'm sorry, about two weeks after Citizens United was decided, and it was also about two weeks for after, after Obamacare passed the House, passed the Senate. So the same time that Citizens United was decided and Obamacare passed the House, this happened. Okay, what happened? The president made all these statements saying that in Citizens United it was the worst thing ever. The Supreme Court. Reverse 100 is a precedent. The, uh, they opened the floodgates of foreign spending. I think they meant his coffers, I guess, now in hindsight. Yeah. But the, the, <laughs> the issue was Justice Alito apparently thought he was at the Supreme Court and thought there were no cameras there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is why they don't want cameras. <laughs> this. So he was right on camera, and I was watching live. And, oh, my God, did he just do that? Yeah, he did. So he didn't actually wag his finger, but he shook his head and said, not true. Um, and, and even got gift, so it, it's real. Okay, <laughs> he said not true. Okay, so I think we can derive a lesson from this little exercise that President Obama is not afraid to confront the court. He's not. He's not afraid to call the court out when they're sitting five feet away from him. And you need to have this in your mind when you understand what would happen in the latter part of 2012 if this case was decided. I, I think this is essential to understanding the history. Okay, so we go forward now. Has anyone ever actually um, uh, uh, gone to the Supreme Court without tickets? Oh. Did you camp outside? Yeah. It was how, really how, cool. how long did you camp for? Uh, it was pretty boring docket, so it's pretty Anyone? How, how long? Yeah, no, without tickets. How long did you camp for? OK, well, whatever. I did. I've done this several times, right? So for McDonald v. Chicago, this is a big Second Amendment case a few years ago. I waited about 14 hours outside. In the middle of March, in the winter, it's freezing. And I'll give you a pro tip. At 3 a.m., the sprinkles come on. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee item tour. OK, it's not fun. So <laughs> there's no way into the Supreme Court. So the only way there is to actually physically be there. Okay, There are no cameras. So oh, actually, here you can see it was actually raining and sleeting the entire week of the Obamacare case. Who wants to guess how long the first person online waited for a seat? Two days. 96 hours. It was a single mom from Atlanta. She had two disabled children. Healthcare was very important for her. She wants some publicity also. But she waited 96 hours. I spoke with her. She's a nice lady. But she wanted 96 hours on the front of the line. And she had, she had these tents and these all these things. Um, the only place to go to the bathroom is actually Union Station, which is a 15-minute walk. And if you leave your spot, you risk the line takers moving up. The line takers are actually pernicious, right? So I don't mind line takers. I like markets, but I like markets to be fair. So one line waiter can save three or four spots, which is BS, OK? Because I once waited, and I was number like 42. And somehow over the end of the line, I became number 49. And only like the first 50 in, I was the last person admitted once, which was, which was very fortunate. All right. So uh, argument day came. The, uh, it was kind of a circus on the street, because there were hundreds of people protesting. Um, but inside the Supreme Court, it was quiet, because the only way we can figure out what's going on is by reading the transcripts, which I've fortunately done for you, or you can listen to it on C-SPAN. Okay? So there were actually with three argument days. Uh, it, it, this was the most argument time award to a case in, I think, four or five decades. It had been, it, it been a lot. So what were the three issues? So on day number one, this was Tuesday, the tax issue and the Anti-Injunction Act issue. Okay? Day number two, what was the issue? Commerce Clause. Can Congress use their commerce powers to mandate people buy insurance? Okay. Day number three was a double header. Okay. In the morning, can the mandate be severed? In other words, if the mandate's unconstitutional, can we sever it from the rest of the Affordable Care Act? And the afternoon was something I haven't really mentioned, but I will now. It was the Medicaid expansion, right? Can Congress force states to join the Medicaid expansion? What do I mean by that? Well. Historically, people at the poverty line were required under, under federal law to be given Medicaid by their states. Okay? Obamacare expanded that. So instead of people at 100% of the poverty line, now people at 133% of the poverty line are required to be given health care. And the states have this is a form of coercion. Okay? 
So again, day one, this was Paul Clement versus Don Verrilli, uh, and they argued about the Anti-Injunction Act. And no one was really paying attention to this day. In fact, the lady who waited 96 hours was waiting for day number two. She should have gone in for day number one. This was actually the most important day, which everyone ignored, except for Larry Tribe. Okay? Uh, on day number one, the SG was very persuasive in telling the court, listen, the, the most reasonable way of reading this opinion is not as a mandate. He said, there is no mandate. Instead, there is a penalty. I'm sorry. I, I messed it up. It's hard to say. He said, there is no mandate, and there is no penalty. There is a tax on not having insurance. Even though the statute says you shall have insurance, remember shall is a mandatory word, and the statute says penalty, the Solicitor General said the best way of reading the statute is a tax on not having insurance. Okay? This is effectively what Kavanaugh was hinting at. And I actually I once told him this, and he kind of just shooed me away. But this was what Kavanaugh was hinting at. And, and I think the, the, the SG ran with it. The Chief Justice, again, no one needs to listen to this, said, so, so said General, if I understand you correctly, it's a government's representation that the law imposes no mandate, right? And there's just a tax not having insurance. And the SG said, yes, Your Honor. That sentence was cited in the Roberts' opinion. Go read the tra It is. There's a cite to that line in the transcript where it really said that. Because Roberts needed that inferential leap to make his decision. Because if the government says there's no actual mandate, it's just a tax, that lets Robert do what he did, which probably no one knows who did. But I'll get there later. Okay? And on day one, all they were talking about was, is the tax or not a tax? That wasn't the issue. It's, can it be read as a tax? There's actually precedent to support this. And this is really, to his credit, pulled out. Okay? Day two, though, really his biggest opponent was a glass of water. So, uh, wait. So the SG's policy is to do two moots for each oral argument. He had three arguments, that means six moots. He did six two-hour moots in a week, okay? That makes your voice shot. That's a lot of talking. I'm, my, my voice is sore for one class, okay? He got up to the podium, took a sip of water, right? Walked to the podium, started talking for 20 seconds. The water went down the wrong pipe. He started choking. He actually could not breathe. He couldn't even get a breath. You can actually hear in the audio, there's no video, you hear in the audio, he's clinking for a glass of water and drinking it. It was like seven seconds of silence in the Supreme Court, right on his opening. Like he barely made a pass as the Chief Justice may please the court. Um, the RNC ran this bad ad, which took the audio and doctored it to make it seem twice as long. And the headline was, not even Obama's lawyer can sell this law. Uh, I think that was in bad taste. But it, 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 was, really, it was really embarrassing. Um, meanwhile, though, he had his opening committed to memory. This is skill. He repeated his opening from memory verbatim. I checked the transcript. So he had his opening cold. Okay? So for all the people who said he did a bad job and he wasn't prepared, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. And where do we see this? There was a question from Justice Alito. And Justice Alito goes, Mr. Solicitor General, please tell us what is your limiting principle? I remember that question. And Brilli gave a really apparently bad answer. He kind of rambled about necessary and proper and this and that. But if you read what he wrote in the transcript, it's almost verbatim from the brief, right? In other words, what he said in court was exactly what the government's position was. His decision was to not give a clear limiting principle. Why? Because he thought if he gave one, the court would just use it against him, reject, and say, that's not far enough. So he was willing to actually hang his hat on his Commerce Clause argument, his taxing argument. That was a, that was a gamble. So he lost in the Commerce Clause, but through the miraculous graces of a guy I don't know who, he actually won on the, on the taxing bargain. Okay? Paul Clement killed it. He killed it. His argument was meticulous. It was flawless. Uh, and actually, I think he actually won it that day. Not that, that victory would not be long-lived. Uh, so on day three, you had more arguing about the severability. Um, of course, Justice Scalia had to get the broccoli question in. Uh, <laughs> and there, there were actually questions about buying GM vehicles. Uh, so you actually have the politics seeped into the political uh, proceedings, which I'm not, not a fan of. Okay. So on the final day, you argue about the Medicaid. Okay. So after the case was being argued, everyone thought that the decision would rest in the fate of Baltimore, right? Everyone thought that he would just, oh, Kennedy, sorry, that 
see if we're paying attention. So Justice Kennedy would actually decide, is this law constitutional? Time magazine put him on the cover, you know, there's this, this beautiful photo of him, right? No. Well, it wasn't, was, wasn't Tony. It was, it was Johnny, right? It'd be the chief. It'd be the chief justice who came to this court to, to, to preside over a less divided court, to be the umpire, to be... Uh, to, to be to be the uh, the John Marshall of the 20th century, 21st century, it would be the it'd be Chief Justice Roberts who would be the one to decide this issue. And I love this picture. He's looking all doe eyed, throwing like a deer in the headlights. I was like, oh my god, oh my god. But it'd be Roberts who did it. Now um, I talk a lot in the book, which is available for sale anywhere, uh, about what happened, um, and I can tell you some stuff. So you might know that Jan Crawford came out with reports uh, in July of 2012 saying that at some point in, she's vague when, but at some point late in the game, the Chief Justice changed his vote, okay? So here's what I heard from my, my, my sources. So at the conference, which was actually held the Monday after the arguments, uh, the Chief Justice was pretty set on voting to strike it down on Commerce Clause grounds, but he was somewhat on the fence, you know, wavering, if you will, on the taxing issue, okay? He was on the fence. At some point in April, people in the court, the justices, started getting the sense that he wasn't going to go along with striking it down. So each party started drafting separate opinions, right? You had the joint opinion from the uh, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito, and then you had the uh, other opinion from Sotomayor and Ginsburg, right? But as early as April, people knew what was going on. This wasn't some sort of last-minute slapdash attempt, right? You know, people said, oh, the, the dissent refers to the Ginsburg opinion as a dissent. Well, actually, that part actually was a dissent because they only have four votes. Okay? But I think what's more interesting, I talk about this in the book, is what happened outside the court. So two days after the conference, right? The conference I think was on Friday, which was on Monday. The president gave an impromptu speech, no one prompted him, no teleprompter, where he said it would be, I swear to God, unprecedented for the court to strike this law down. The president compared striking it down to Lochner. I, I, I could not find a single other sitting president since Roosevelt who actually knew the word Lochner in, in anything. Actually, it was Teddy. Uh, in anything, okay? So he actually had a president comparing the court to Lochnerism and saying to the court they should, quote, exercise their jurisprudence carefully. George Bush could not have him. He could not have strung those words together for the life of him. He should exercise their jurisprudence carefully. They should not be like Lochner. It would be unprecedented for the court to strike this down. Okay? I, I will leave you to draw your own conclusions. But the timing of all these things, in my mind, has to impact the Chief Justice's decision of what to do. Okay? You have all these political pressures coming from the outside. Oh, and then there was a leak. I didn't get there yet. So remember when I said that people in April knew someone was up? This leaked outside the court. Okay? And you have pieces from George Will and Kathleen Park and others saying, hey, Chief Justice Roberts, grow a backbone, right? They weren't, they weren't just all coming to the same talking point. They were operating on intelligence. They knew stuff going on, okay? So this was a battle fought as much in the court as out the court. And I, I only did a little bit. I have a lot more in the, in the book about this, okay? So what happened, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did the handshake, right? John Roberts upheld the law. How did he do it? This was the answer to my question that I asked for the free book is this cartoon, right? This cartoon actually explains just about all of it. So what happened? He did a couple things. First, he said, I accept the government's representation that the Anti-Injunction Act does not apply, okay? For purposes of statutory interpretation, Obamacare is not a tax, okay? Because if it was a tax for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act, we couldn't hear it now. One. Two. But it is a tax for purposes of the Constitution. So the same law can be not a tax for purposes of a statute, the Anti-Injunction Act, but it is a tax for purposes of the Constitution, the taxing power. Even though the statute's not called a tax, John Roberts admitted that, he will use a, quote, saving construction. He will save it. He will construe this penalty as a tax in order to uphold its constitutionality. Okay? Once he makes that leap, which is exactly what Judge Kavanaugh said and exactly what uh, the SG said, he's home. Because if this had been enacted as a tax in 2010, there's not much of an argument against it, but they didn't want to take the political hit. Okay? So what, what Roberts basically did was he took out the mandate. 
it is no longer a mandate to have insurance. And the SG had another representation. He said that in the view of the DOJ, there is no crime or there's no collateral consequence for not having insurance. In other words, if you don't have an insurance, we can't do anything to you. Okay. So this is actually significant. Everyone know that if you don't pay the penalty, they can't collect anything from you. The only way the government can actually collect the penalty is by withholding it from your tax refund. No one's going to pay the penalty. This is be the biggest funny thing ever. No one's going to pay it. Okay? You go with that insurance, the only thing the government can do for you is withhold it from your tax return. They can't issue any liens. They can't sue you for it. They can't take you to court. This is going to be such a mess. Once people get catch on to this, anyway, uh, now, now I just told everyone the secret. Okay. So Justices uh, 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 Kennedy and Scalia and Alito and, and Thomas, they will strike down the entire thing, including the Medicaid expansion, all of it. So, I mean, they got four votes to strike it all down. So close. So far. You know it's not happy. Uh, Justice Thomas dissent separately saying he would strike down the 20th century um, and, and bring us back to the days of a... Uh, basically. Just, just, just as uh, uh, Breyer and Kagan, they actually joined the Medicaid expansion opinion, which, which one would lead one to believe they moderated it, but won't we'll believe that speculation. And uh, Notorious RBG and Justice Sotomayor, they would have voted to poll the entire thing. Notorious RBG. You could Google it. It's with Bader Ginsburg. Anyway. But the funnier part was, as you know, there are no cameras in the court. So how do the people outside the court know what's going on? Well, you have this thing called runners, where they release the paper copies. Oh, by the way, preview things to come, the Supreme Court's website went down that morning, right? The people actually trying to use it. And it went down for hours. So the only way to get a copy of the opinion was to actually be at the court. So you have these interns in the street with, with sneakers grabbing a copy of the opinion, like 200 pages, and running to the street where the reporters were waiting, right? So this happened, right? So not to pick at CNN, but I will. Um, one of the reporters was seen on the street holding a copy of the opinion. And she's telling Wolf Blitzer, and she's reading from page three. You can see which page she's reading from, page three. She's telling Wolf Blitzer, Wolf, the, the, the chief justice found that the mandate, well, it's a commerce clause, it's unconstitutional, right? Wolf Blitzer goes wall to wall. CNN's entire network said the mandate is struck down. I mean, they, around the world, they're global network, right? Like that? <laughs> yeah, I, I've done this before. This was Dewey to beat Truman. But even worse, guess who was watching CNN? <laughs> so for a solid eight minutes, the president thought his law was unconstitutional. This is, you can't make this stuff up. It's like in a book or something. So for a solid eight minutes, POTUS thought this was unconstitutional. Had the reporter flipped to page four of the syllabus, she would have seen the part where it said, but <laughs> the court applies a saving construction the law is constitutional. Okay? Uh, in fairness, Fox made the same mistake. Actually, Megyn Kelly was reading SCOTUS blog in her iPad, and, and she corrected course, but Fox didn't officially do it. In other, in other words, Megyn Kelly was saying, uh, the court upheld it, but Fox ran the banner for like another eight minutes, and they never really apologized. But anyway. So one of Obama's uh, White House counsels walks into the Oval Office, and she gives him the thumbs up. And he's like, but I thought we lost. He's like, no, no, we won. Like, Are you sure? He's like, no, we won. Okay, so... Thank you. You, you kill my dude if it's Truman joke, but I'll, I'll let slide. Anyway. So in the end, the law will survive. I think the SG got a really bum rap, but I think he did a really good job. Uh, John Roberts, um, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't know what was in his heart of hearts, and I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, he did what he did for a reason. Um, his opinion kind of makes sense, but was a really tough way of getting to the answer, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to judge. Um, he did get attacked vociferously. Uh, Glenn Beck and others were saying that he was a coward. Um, but we have to remember there was an election going on. And that the very, that very day, uh, his name, Romney, uh, you know, went on a platform repealing Obamacare, which is difficult to swallow because he effectively created it in his home state of Massachusetts. Um, during every single debate, whenever health care was brought up, Obama goes, you are the godfather of Obamacare. Obama told Romney, you created this. This is your idea. You created the mandate in Massachusetts, which he was right. I mean, there's a difference between the federal government doing it and the state government doing it. Uh, you know, you know that. But, but this was his idea. So I thought, actually, that in November 2012, that was the end of the fight over Obamacare. Uh, and I have, I've had to update this presentation since. So uh, this, is, this is actually the president's third inauguration. I would love to hear what they said right here. This would be January 2013. I would just love to have a press report of what was said. But I thought this debate was over. See, this is how I used to end my presentation with this slide of, you know, the president looking forward, realizing, uh-oh, I got three years left, right? 
But John Roberts looking to the future, saying, I got 30 years left, right? But then, <laughs> God bless. So our, our own homegrown boy, Senator Ted Cruz, <laughs> decided to single-handedly bring, <laughs> bring Obamacare back to the fore. And he did this by reading his children Green Eggs and Ham on the Senate floor on the filibuster, which where many of us watched. Uh, yes. So uh, Ted Cruz, of course, filibustered this issue a few months ago. We forgot about this already. And there's this tire coming off. And with this filibuster, gathered so much interest on Obamacare. And we forgot about this also. Remember the government got shut down? Like, did anyone notice here in Texas? No. No. Oh, apparently, people in Washington did because all the parks were closed. Uh, and and then, then this side, remember the barricades? Remember this? We have such short attention spans. But this is all Obamacare driven. The entire government was shut down because they did not want to fund Obamacare. Meanwhile, what does Ted Cruz want? He wants to delay Obamacare. What's Obama going to do? Delay it. Oh, oh, wait till they delay the mandate. This is coming. The insurance company is already pissed because you have uh, these un imbalanced risk pools. I'll get back to that later. So then, then the next, <laughs> poor Adrian. So the next day in the struggle, by the way, everyone know uh, who Adrian is? I got five minutes. I'm good. So this is actually Adrian. She's not even a U.S. citizen. She took this photograph for free because she wanted to have a free headshot. I can't make this up. Anyway, her name's Adrian. So October 1st, right around when Ted Cruz was showing down the government, healthcare.gov launches. <laughs> This is from The Onion. I didn't make this up. Not good, right? <laughs> Website was down nonstop. People spending hours and hours and hours waiting to sign up, and it was, didn't work. And the president set a December 1st deadline, hoping and praying that everything would work. And, 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 and okay, in fairness, they, they fixed the website for the most part. There are going to be lingering problems. People who signed up, they're on records. That's going to not be the problem. The bigger problem with these ones, right? What's this? Cancellation notice. The entire promise this law is built on was if you like your policy, you can keep it. This was the lesson learned from Hillary Care, right? This was the lesson learned. Promise not kept. PolitiFax said lie of the year. It got four Pinocchios. Okay? You've had Kathleen Sebelius testifying nonstop in front of the Congress. Uh, if, <laughs> you know, we asked Chris Christie to fire his uh, deputy with the bridge thing, and she, she still has a job, so I, I don't even know. Anyway. Mini preview. So we have more Obamacare litigation of the Hobby Lobby case. And this case considers whether the Supreme Court can coerce a, a Christian-owned, Christian-infused company from providing contraceptives to the poor, and also apparently whether the little sisters of the poor must give condoms to their nuns. I I, I don't know, but these, <laughs> these, these I can't even work. No, you can't make it up. The little sisters of the poor, do, they, do their nuns need condoms? I, I guess they do. I don't know. So <laughs> Constitution. This animates so much of what we do. It's powered so much constitutional strife, and this law of Obamacare will keep going on. Okay, and with that, I, I conclude, and I welcome any of your questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I guess uh, a general question uh, on the limits of the president's ability uh, through regulation to rewrite legislation, and uh, you know, and essentially to make it say something it doesn't say. Uh, in fact, the opposite of what it says. Yeah, so in some the issue there is who has standing to challenge it. Exactly. So what's interesting, I mentioned the Ron Johnson suit. So he's a Wisconsin senator, and he and one of his staffers have actually brought suit against OPM, saying that they effectively changed a rule without going through the, through the right process. And Paul Clement's their lawyer, okay? Paul Clement won't take a case that doesn't have standing, or maybe he will. But I, I think if he took the case, he's researched it closely. And I think they actually have a shot at challenging the ability of the, exec the executive branch of changing laws on a whim, just, just because. Um, that suit, structure is important, right? If a court finds that the president lacks the structural power, that's really significant. So keep an eye on that in the back of your mind. I'll put it in the third book or something. I don't even know. Yes, sir, in the front? What about the origination of the tax? Okay, so that's the other issue. So as I said, the Supreme Court said the only way Obamacare is constitutional is if it's a tax. Okay, James Madison said taxes must originate in the House, closer to the people. Okay, did Obamacare originate in the House? That's currally being litigated in a case called Sicil. It's, it's pending argument at DC Circuit next February. I think we have a couple new judges that might hear that case. So the issue in Sicil is is the has the origination clause been violated? Okay, this has never been litigated before. I don't think there's ever been a challenge on the origination clause one. Two, the government has this argument that's something called a shell bill, which I'd never heard of, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's an empty bill that began in the House, 
which they then sent over to the Senate where they put Obamacare in. It's an empty shell. I mean, this is put in form of a substance. But the issue is, if they did this entire shell bill thing, then they acknowledge that it was a revenue-raising measure that actually is a tax. So that actually argument cuts against them. So the D.C. Circuit, though, but here's the issue. If the D.C. Circuit finds that the registration clause is violated, all of Obamacare falls immediately. All of it. Because the government said the mandate cannot be separated from the law, except when the president delays it by a year. Okay? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Quick comment. A question. The comment is, actually, did notice when the government shut down. Believe it or not, the U.S. Attorney's Office has taken five doors to Wells Fargo Tower for our office. There were a bunch of unhappy U.S. attorneys who were, who were being necessary to not get time off. So, <laughs> that's a grumpy people who shared the old question is, I remember an exchange, I wasn't a part of the argument, I remember an exchange with Alito and, uh, and Marilli where, and I thought it was on the first day, where he said, don't, don't come back to me tomorrow and say, this is a tax, and you're telling me it's not a tax on day one. So, do I no, you're exactly right. So Alito said, General, let me get this straight. Today you're going to tell me it's not a tax, and tomorrow you're going to tell me it is a tax. And then General Voli said, that's right, Your Honor. Yes. Any other questions in the back? Yes, sir. Yeah, what, um, so what's the state of the Supreme Court's uh, commerce jurisprudence? Uh, is it possibly an opinion that say that it's unconstitutional in commerce power? Is that, that uh, having bearing on the case? So, I mean, I'll give you the short view and the long view, right? So the short view, the opinion is narrow. It only impacts purchase mandate. So Congress wants to mandate you purchase something that's unconstitutional. But in the big view, it was unclear if the Rehnquist Federalism Revolution continues the Roberts Court. That wasn't even an open question. This case, I think, says, yeah, we will police the bounds of what Congress can and cannot do. Uh, in the words of Professor Larry Solomon, it, it affected our constitutional gestalt, that we realize that there are things Congress can't do, and that's really significant, just something that that limit is there. If um, the court decided it was a tax, I thought it was a The Chief Justice totally glossed over it. I mean, I can talk about it with you later, but the Chief Justice eventually made up like 15, it didn't, make it up, but it didn't come from the briefs. He wrote like 15 pages of stuff just on his own research of the direct tax power, but this was not really an issue that was very briefed much. Very same term, I think. Uh, the court, after additional briefing, they should have. They, they sh yes, they, they should have asked more briefing on this issue, but that would fit the end. There's no way that. Chief, I mean, I didn't, he didn't actually make it up, but it was not something from the briefs. He did independent research on history to the direct tax power, which was, I like, I think Paul Clement said it was a paragraph in the brief on this. Something like that. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yes, I think it's actually the 16th Amendment. Uh, the the <sighs> I don't think so. Is it, the income tax amendment. So this came up a little bit of whether I see the question, whether it was direct tax, whether it was a portion. This is my friend Ilya Shapiro calls this a unicorn tax. It's never been seen before. It'll never be seen again. This is this weird thing that just had to exist to make Obamacare work. Other questions? Yes, sir. You know, the Chief's opinion in Citizens United is very interesting. So he did say that, but he also expressed a strong uh, uh, belief in judicial modesty. He said that very clearly. And I think for whatever reason, the Chief's belief in judicial modesty trumped his belief in constitutionalism here. I mean, the entire idea of a saving construction is premised in the idea that I have to, like, do double limbo and bend over backwards to try and save this law. I will rewrite a law that Congress didn't. I will enact a law that imposes a tax that Congress could not have done in order to save a law Congress did right. I mean, that, that is... That that is a very that that's a very bold move, Ted. Well, I mean, Congress is it really just a question of magic words. All Congress had to do was say magic words, exact same law, exact same. I mean, I think text matters. Yeah, and and but not even see the way I read the Chief Justice's opinion. What if Congress enacts again tomorrow the Affordable Care Act too and uses the same exact language? Would the court not uphold it in the same manner? In other words, if Congress passes another penalty tomorrow, 
And the second goes to court and say, oh, just kidding, it's a tax. Under an FB, will the court have to uphold it? And the answer is yes. So the court actually set a precedent for saving laws that were never actually written. Yes, sir. How do you teach novice law students what you just said to us? Come to my class next Monday. <laughs> Is gonna be there? I'm actually I'm actually doing a double class on FIB. It's a four hour class with the entire case uh, towards the end because it captures everything: commerce clause, federalism, individual rights, uh, spending power, uh, uh, jurisprudence. I mean, I'm going to do a, a, a single four hour block in this class. It's hard to do it on those little cards. <laughs> yeah, or you can. You need a card to use a book. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. God bless Texas. I, no, no hands are raised. Uh, I I haven't. I get through my employer not for long though. So, but the everyone knows about the everyone knows about the Cadillac tax though, right? There's going to be a massive tax in 2018. All generous plans. For example, my my HR people said. Our plans are going to really suck in a few years because they're going to be able to offer them because they're so generous. The unions will be accepted, but not anyone else. Um, just wait. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. So, so, so in fairness, the people at Jones Day who argued this on behalf of the NFIB and people at Paul Clement's firm, they knew this was coming. Right. This this was not a surprise to them. They had a lot of briefing on this. And I talked to one of the Jones Day lawyers, and he told me, if we lose on the taxing power, this is how we lose. He knew, he knew this was going to come. And if the Chief Justice accepted the government's representation that there's no actual mandate, that there's no collateral consequence if they don't have insurance, this is easy. Right. That's a huge leap. Once the Chief made that leap, this case was hard. And so they, they knew it was coming. Um, and in fairness, Professor Larry Tribe, uh, he teaches, a, you might have heard of him, he teaches at Harvard. Uh, he teaches a combo class I think, the Friday after argument, and he had this entire discussion, which I actually quote and blog. He said, "You know, we're at the Chief Justice, and he was he seems to be very interested in this idea that there's no mandate. And I think if, if the Chief Justice alone buys it, that might be enough to save the law. And that's why it's Larry Tribe. But just about everyone else missed it, right? Everyone's looking at commerce, commerce, closet, commerce. I was, but it was the tax issue. It was this mundane, arcane anti-injunction act. The thing I asked you at the beginning that no one knew about. That's what saved this law." It, I think it was passed in the 1860s, Ted. You probably know. It was passed in the 1860s or 70s. This law saved Obamacare. Granted, they're Reconstruction Republicans. I don't know. So, any <laughs> other, other, other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so that, that's, that's a Pruitt case. So, I mentioned this in passing. So, the, the Affordable Care Act law itself says subsidies can be provided for, for state-run exchanges. So, you know, if New York runs an exchange, and I'm in New York, I want to buy health insurance, I can go online, and the feds pay subsidies directly to the insurer. Okay? That minimizes the sticker shock. Okay? When I say subsidies, I mean tax dollars. right? So we're actually paying to subsidize people's health insurance, whatever. But what happens if the feds are running the exchange? You know, healthcare.gov and poor Adrian, right? Can the feds pay subsidies in the federal exchange? If you read the text of the statute very closely, the answer is clearly no, you can't. The, the statute says subsidies for state-run exchanges. It couldn't be clearer. But there's a case in, in, um, in Oklahoma, which is by Scott Pruitt, another case in Washington by, uh, by John Adler and Michael Cannon. It's called the Halbig case, which says that Congress is acting ultra virus. They cannot give these subsidies in the state run in the federal exchange. Um, they've actually survived the motion to dismiss in a couple stage in a couple in a couple cases, and a decision is any day now. I mean, but the impact of that suit, right? If they win. The exchanges in like 34 states have to effectively become useless because no one's going to buy insurance without the subsidies because the prices are too high. This is why Obamacare disabled the window share, the window shopping feature, right? So originally Obamacare was set up that you can go online and see your prices, but that would be before the subsidies are applied. <coughs> a decision was made by someone, can't find out who, that we do not want to show any prices until you put all of your information and calculate the subsidies, right? Because if you start window shopping and see the, sub the price of that subsidies, you walk away, okay? So if... The 10th Circuit case wins, right? All that goes away. The prices will basically double, triple, which is so. So the the short term effect is Obamacare becomes entirely unaffordable, no more insurance, right? That will push us into what's called an adverse selection death spiral, right? Where no one's buying insurance, prices skyrocket, and the entire market goes to hell. Okay? I don't know what happens if they win. I mean, it's kind of a weird suit because if they win, the entire thing collapses on its own weight. So you have the origination clause, and you have the Medicaid exchange cases. If both of those suits win, which I don't, I have no idea, the entire law collapses. My last comment will be, 
The court had an option to stop this in 2012 before anyone relied on it. They didn't. I don't know why people will think that in 2015, when you have millions of people relying on it, the court will. I don't. You have people using this. Uh, don't let tech, don't tell tech crews not to listen to this. But uh, there are people using this. And if, perversely, people are going to like this insurance, they're going to want to keep it. Right? To repeal Obamacare would require taking insurance away from people who like it. Well, they like it because it's free and cheap. But you're, it's really difficult to take away stuff. So any reforms to Obamacare must start from that premise. Now, there are ways of fixing it and making it better, but the damage is done. And we're going to be stuck with this for some time to come. Uh, maybe I'll write another five books on this. I don't even know. Anyway, any other questions? George, thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, sir.